Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 118, recorded September 4th, 2013. Tim Jennison. Triangulation is brought to you by Shutterstock.com with over 28 million high quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips. Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 30% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use the offer code Triangulation in the number nine. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get some of the smartest, most interesting people online in here and talk to them and ask them questions and learn a lot. And I'm so glad you're here for today's Triangulation because we have a living legend in studio with us. His name is Tim Jennison. And I think more than anybody, he makes what we do or made what we do possible. Uh, the father, really, I think a lot of people say of desktop video. Tim, it's so nice to meet you. Thank you for... Thanks for us. having me. It's Founder of New here. Tech, which we, of course, have been using since day one. I decided when I was looking for a switcher what to use, I said, this is it. This is the one. And we've grown with, uh, with, with your products as they've gotten more and more powerful. Well, you're, you're the kind of person we kind of had in mind. You know, uh, broadcast television is uh, inaccessible, and um, we wanted to, to democratize video. It gives us the capability of doing effectively broadcast like uh, television uh, for a fraction of the cost. But let me go, I want to start at the, at the beginning. We were talking before the show, you, you grew up in Iowa. Your dad was an engineer, mechanical, civil engineer? Electrical and mechanical, Electrical. yeah. And he, we always, he always had a bench in the basement with all the tubes and I was getting shocks and, <laughs> you know, crawling up in his bench when he wasn't there. But he, I sort of learned electronics from him by osmosis almost. I remember sitting on his knee when I was probably five years old and he had the ohm meter and, he, and he'd say, okay, Ohm's law is I equals E over R. And, and, and you know, it's beyond me. But, what is you know, that? I don't even know what I and E are, let yeah, alone exactly. R. <laughs> so, but years later, it sort of rung a bell. It was in your head. It was, it was in, built it was in. in. Yeah. And, and he just, you know, like a lot of people, he, um, technical people, they, they just assume you, right. you understand everything you know you're saying. Is. Yeah. And then he did. So, and, um, <laughs> but I, I learned electronics with vacuum tubes. And later in life, I had oh, to cool. relearn everything, you know, with solid state. Do you remember, bu like, building? Did you do heat oh, sure. kits as a kid? No, did not you? kits. No, you didn't even do kits. You did it from scratch. Right, right. Yeah, so, you bread, breadboarding. You take a piece of really? wood, you pound in nails and connect wires. And, no kidding. Yeah. Wow. And Dad had the resistors and the capacitors and the diodes and everything. Junk box. Do you remember the f the first projects you did? I mean, what oh, they were? Yeah, were well, they radios? Yeah, one of my first ones was a um, a forty meter ham transmitter, <laughs> a single tube. I thought I'm thinking crystal radio. Okay. Oh yeah, I had a crystal radio. <laughs> you yeah. built a ham a forty meter yeah. ham transmitter. But I lived in the country <laughs> and you know f far away from other people and and uh, these tubes and transistors were my f my they best friends. They brought the world you know? in. Yeah. As a kid, I wasn't that sophisticated, but I remember listening to shortwave radio and just being blown away that you could, yeah. and you could hear people in Russian, and it was so cool. So, you, did you get a ham license at that time? Or? Um, I was a ham operator. Uh, Unlicensed. Now, it did I like. have a license? <laughs> that's, that's another question. I've heard, so, I've heard people say it that way yeah. before. Yeah, I know. What that yeah, means. but I. I um, Sure. Yeah, it just seemed like such a hassle to go through, you yeah. know, fill out the paperwork and yeah. stuff. But I did learn Morse code. I did, did you? operate yeah. a lot. And you have a license now. I have a now. license now, yes. Yeah. What's your call sign? Alpha Foxtrot 5 Golf Golf. I have Alpha. 5GG. And where do you live on the ham bands? I, I hang around uh, 40 meters mostly. And, Still? And, and 20 meters. Yeah, 40 meters is my favorite. You, you fell in love with 40. <laughs> well, there's a group of guys on, on 40 meters. Man, we're nerding out on ham radio here. That's okay. Uh, there, that's that's what we do of, here. There's a group of guys that are into high-quality audio. Ah. And I'm one of them. And uh, we, we just like to sound as good as you can sound on ham radio. And not everybody likes that sort of thing because right. we use a little more bandwidth on the band. Right. You know, we'll use uh, 6 kilohertz instead of 2.8 kilohertz. Yeah. 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 And sometimes people complain, and then we just turn it down and say, okay, <laughs> it's an awful fat signal the guy's setting. And this, you're doing it at San Antonio now. You, uh -huh. You've moved down with... Uh, yeah, live in San Antonio. With New Tech. So that's cool. So you built the radios as a kid. When did it go digital for you? Uh, seventh grade. Seventh grade science fair project. Um, I built a rudimentary computer uh, that um, could add 
in base 10, and it could multiply. That's pretty sophisticated. 10. Yeah. And this was at the, at the time when integrated circuits, the very first integrated circuits, were starting to show up in, you know, logic gates. Right. Do you remember what you used? Uh, yeah, it was a UL914. Uh, was I think that's right. It was one of the gates. Oh, uh, man, I could think of the names of those chips. It's so cool that, that you uh, could... You, it's funny how you do... It kind of implants itself in your mind. Yeah. Um, and so, at that point... Computing, personal computing, was was a pipe dream. Still, I mean, it was just the beginning of ICs. Even science fiction, you know, as a kid, you're reading science fiction. Nobody was writing science fiction stories about having a computer. They were big in your room, pocket, room size yeah, things. Yeah, it, it was, was like, all nine thousands. Once in a while, there'd be a uh, sci-fi story about he pulled a calculator out of his pocket <laughs> and multiplied. No, the, you know, they'll never be that small. <laughs> but nobody saw the computers coming. You know, yeah. There was always going to be a brain inside a mountain somewhere. Do you remember your first uh, personal computer? Oh, yeah, I, I built it. It was, uh, it was a 6800 Motorola. Um, not a kit, not an MSI or something no, like that. You no. built it from scratch. Yep. Because uh, yeah, they were all using Zilog chips and... Yeah, and they were expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, frankly couldn't afford the kits, um, but it was so exciting back then. I mean, so that was like, wow, I have a computer. And, you know, then you had to figure out something to do with it. So, right, right. Uh, that was the hard part. And we had to set all these switches, and it just took You didn't hours. have a, a, a teletype interface. Not, you had not, to, you not had not to right flip away. the front, right. the front switches. But then, I, you know, I went through the teletype phase. I've got, in fact, I have a, a pretty cool collection of old teletypes, some very rare ones. Um, Did I see you have, see our I old have your one model out in the 15. lobby? Yeah. Uh, I, I have a Model 12. Oh. Uh, model 12. <laughs> you got me beat. Yeah, Model 12. <laughs> it's the first uh, first uh, unit made by the Teletype Corporation. That thing looks like it's steam-powered. That thing is so big. Have you fired it up? Does it no, run? I don't even know if it works. I, I'll get it running for you. Really? Yeah, they they almost always work. Just a little... You couldn't break them? little oil. No, they're absolutely... There's big iron. heavy metal gears and... Yeah. Wow, that's really... Uh, so... Um, did what was your what did what did you major in college? I mean, what was your interest? Was it electronics um, then, or rock and roll, <laughs> um, sex, drugs, and rock uh, and roll, pin, like all of pinball. us? Pinball, pinball, yeah, yeah, pinball. There's some. There's a nexus between uh, engineering minds and pinball. I don't know what uh, it there is. There absolutely is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in my case, it was a game called Jack in the Box uh, by Gottlieb. We called <laughs> it Cram the Clowns. There were ten. <laughs> drop targets across the top, each with a crown, clown face, and you have to get them all down. Yep. And yeah. that's where all my quarters and spare time went. And so... Sounds like I, a wasted youth. I hate to well, tell you, Tim. Well, yeah, I, I left college <laughs> shortly thereafter. Yes. And I, I, I really consider it to be, you know, like a four-year head start on my peers. The fact that I got the heck out of college when I did. Now, all the great founders, I'm not going to say this, kids, be cool, stay in school, but I have to point out a lot of these great founders, myself included. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say it's maybe not such a good idea to go to school. I mean, you end up deeply in debt. Yep. Uh, unless you have a rich uncle. Yep. And, you know, um, I was able to educate myself, and I was, had I studied what I wanted to learn, they didn't know about microprocessors. That you know, you, you couldn't take a good course mm -hmm. on. You know, you could study Fortran, I guess, and you could run punch cards. But they didn't know anything about what I wanted to study. And so after I was out of college, I just read books, and I would I would hang out at uh, engineering libraries wherever I was, whatever city I was in, and I just you know made my own courseware. So you did, but you did, you did, you did. taught yourself, I, I have, basically. I have a homemade engineering degree. And uh, was the Amiga your first, like, packaged computer? No. Um, I was into the uh, Tandy computers at first, and I developed some products for the Tandys. You know, it, if Burke or somebody would get, I have an old Tandy that somebody sent me in my room, in my office, I just got, maybe I could show this to you, you could tell me what the heck it is. It's in the, it's in the box in the back, uh, of the room there. People, you know, send us their old stuff. You see, we've got a, a, a Commodore up there, a 128 Pet. Yes. We've got uh, we've got an Osborne over I here. I saw that. We've got one of the um, Amigas. Carson, are you getting for me? It's in the back there, in the in the box. Um, I just want to show this to you. So Tandy yeah. was your first TRS-80s, that yeah, kind TRS of thing. TRS-80 color computer. Co you know, Coco. Yeah. We got a Coco. We had a Coco. Uh, I think it's in the basement now. It, mm. It's running a was running a program. <laughs> well, I, you know, uh, my first product, uh, commercial product, was a um, 
audio mix down system for control studio for control rooms in uh, audio. Mix, People weren't doing studios. this at the time. They weren't no, using was, computers uh, for this stuff. The, the big guys were. Warner were Brothers they? had uh, automated consoles. You know, you got oh, the, yeah, yeah, the multi-track faders, and yeah. the faders. So I made one based on a personal computer, and I thought this was going to be a huge seller. And it wasn't, because it turns <laughs> out what you really need is talent. You don't need <laughs> the uh, automated faders. Carson, come on, just bring it over here. You don't have to... <laughs> I don't even know what this is. Somebody just, somebody just sent me this. This is wild. I don't oh, that's know. a 100. Is it a Model 100? I believe so. Or something. Oh, no, no, that's this not. This is the, the 200 portable yes, computer. Yes, that's, just, that's so the... So, uh, for the young people in the on. audience, this was the height. This might have been the first laptop. A lot of journalists used those. I remember the Model 100. They, they yeah. could send their stories in over the phone line. <laughs> You'd plug it into the phone exactly. line. Exactly. Have a 300 baud modem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I thank you for whoever sent that to me. So then so after, after you that, were, but you, this was a business for you already. Yeah, I I, um, I wrote a paint program for the Coco, for the mm -hmm. color computer called Is uh, it? Coco Max. Coco Max. Mm -hmm. I'm sure people yeah. remember that. So. Uh, this is really, I think this, I did this too. This was a way of taking something you loved and make a hobby and trying to make it, make it so you could afford to buy this stuff and, and yeah. continue to do well, it. Well, my wife was just overjoyed when that first <laughs> check arrived because finally, you know, up to that point, finally. she had to put up with the noisy teletype in the kitchen. <laughs> in the kitchen? Yeah, it was in the kitchen. And it would wake up the babies, you know. And, and, and then checks started arriving, and that was huge. Awesome. That was huge. You can make a living at and this. And then what she did was she, she took some of that money and bought me an Epson RX80 printer so that the teletype <laughs> could go away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the first uh, early dot ma matrix printers. Those yeah. were great, though. They, they were, were really, they were noisy too, though. But they know? weren't as noisy. Not as noisy. They would shake the whole house. The teletype. <laughs> yeah, it was thunder. Yeah. Oh, how cool! <laughs> so you, so you were interested both in hardware and software. You were writing code as yeah. well. Yeah. Did that come naturally to you? Uh, yes. You uh, liked it. I, Basic at first? Fortran was Fortran. the first thing I learned in seventh grade. Oh, my, my cousin God. taught it to me. And um, But then once I had my first uh, computer build, it was, everything was machine language, not even assembly language, machine language, which is related, but it's just like ones and zeros. Well, this is where you had an advantage because the 6800, unlike the Z80 and then the 8086, had a much more elegant yeah, it assembly. Was, it was like a textbook. It was beautiful. Much better than the 6502, which yeah. everybody else was learning on the Apple well, side. W the only book I found in the Iowa State University Library about computers that made any sense at all was a book called Computer Architecture by Caxton Foster. And in this book, he described uh, an elementary computer, a computer that was powerful enough to solve all problems, but as simple as possible. And he described this thing. He says it had two accumulators, and he described it. And later, when I was looking for a chip to build a computer, I realized that the 6800 was almost exactly like Perfect. that, that yeah. uh, classic computer yeah. that was described in the yeah. book. So I, I knew what to do with it. Yeah. So when the Amiga came along, you felt right at home. That's 68,000 based. Yeah, and the reason I was attracted to the Amiga is that I was... Um, I was a video guy. Oh, so video came before the Amiga. Yeah, I was as a kid. I was into filmmaking, made eight millimeter movies. Uh, That's interesting. A in a bit, we're going to get to the fact that you have a new movie, which just showed at the Telluride Film Festival, that is all the rage. So you ended up going full cycle and making movies now. Yeah, I was a frustrated filmmaker. You know, eight millimeter was not a good format, and you had to cut and splice. Oh, horrible. And, yeah. And then when video came out, um, you really couldn't edit that. Uh, I mean, you could try to cut and splice it, but it's worthless. And that's that's kind of why New Tech started. Press pause. <laughs> yeah, pause control editing. Exactly. <laughs> that was it. In fact, a lot of newsrooms were doing the A-B editing kind of like that. Slam a tape in, slam a tape in, mm -hmm. slam a tape in, play a little of that, play a little of that, play a little of that. Mm -hmm. Crazy. So you said this is there's a, computers are the perfect tool for this. Yeah, I, I go computers, video, these it's gotta be a better way. belong together. And i got to emphasize how early this is. I mean... We're, I mean, we're in VCR territory. This is yeah. this is this is analog video sources, right. and the computers were just not fast enough to deal with video. I mean, they could just barely get some characters on the screen. That's it. They could not display. I mean, this is the time of uh, the IBM PC had 16 colors if you include two shades of black. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and the Macintosh was black and white. Black and white, and you had to have a special screwdriver to open it up. And the Amiga came along, and this was 
like a mind blower to me because it could display high quality color imagery, but more important, because of its ancestry in video games, they, uh, they made it uh, compatible with uh, standard video frequencies, NTSC video, so you could gen lock it and uh, you know, I it's said, hugely important to yep. be able to gen lock. Yeah, because you could then feed a camera into it right. and do interesting things to right. video. And that's when the idea. I read the, I think it was the 1985 August, I think it was 1985 issue of Byte Magazine. It was the special on the Amiga computer. I remember that cover yeah. vividly. Yeah, and I'm reading through there and they go NTSC frequencies, gen lock. I go, okay, this is, and this is it. 4,096 colors. Yes. <laughs> Don't forget. Exactly. And, and, and that bouncing ball. <laughs> yeah, and I was just in love. And I, I ordered the first one. I went right, Did you? right down to the Commodore dealer, and I said, I want the first one that comes in, and um, got right to work. What was, the, what was the first thing? It wasn't Video Toaster. No, we did um, a thing called Digiview, which was a video capture oh, device. Yeah. Okay. And you plugged the camera into it. It was a little white box that went on the back of the computer. And video digitizers were, you know, there were a few of them around for, uh, for like an Apple II. Uh, but uh, this, this is one that could actually do 4,096 colors and, and, and uh, sold very well. And it's that was... <laughs> It was the, sort of the venture capital to start up the video. That bootstrapped the next thing. It's so funny because 1985, in many respects, doesn't seem very long ago at all, at least to me, but only to you. Uh, we were just watching The Breakfast Club, 1985. I mean, that seems like a recent, relatively recent movie to me. And yet, in terms of digital technology, this was the Stone Age. And I don't know if people understand how hard it was to do what you were doing. I mean, you were really pushing the limits. I remember Dvorak getting a video toaster. And going crazy, I think he was half in love with Kiki. But I think the other thing was he could—he was doing edit. He was editing, you know, Bill Gates' keynotes and taking all the burps and the ums and putting them all together. And I—I I was blown away that he could do this. Alex Bennett, who was a radio personality here, and was a like—he was doing his own TV show out of his kitchen mm -hmm. with a video toaster. This was a revolution. Yeah, thousands of people suddenly could make video. And Huge. you know, there were people doing video with uh, you know, like two tape decks. All you could do is cuts. You couldn't add right. titles, you couldn't have any right. sort of transitions, and you you couldn't look like a real T V station. Mm -mm. But once the toaster was out there, uh, you could you could get that look. How hard was that to, to make that work? Oh um, <laughs> I just well, I feel like there must have been some long nights. Nowadays with our current products, the TriCasters and 3Play, we are routing all these high def streams through the computer's memory and processing everything in real time. And it's one of the hardest things you can do with a computer, really. And Because there's so much data. Well, and, it, and if you drop a frame, it's the end of the world. Right, it has to be real time, yeah. But back then, uh, you know, and, and so the computers we have now are gigahertz computers and we have gigabytes of RAM and so on and so forth. The Amiga ran at eight megahertz mega <laughs> megahertz so there is no way you're going to get a video signal through that computer it's just not going to happen so our card that installed inside there had its own high speed stuff that then was controlled by the amiga and that was the secret so the, sauce. So the throughput, and was it analog or was it, was it digital? It, it was both analog and digital. It was both. There was an analog section and a digital section. So the analog section did the fades and some of the um, what we called organic wipes, where there would be clouds, you know, revealing one picture over another, and then there was a digital section that would do uh, pushes and um, and uh, digital video effects. So it was it was a hybrid between the two. Anybody who saw the TV show Home Improvement saw video. <laughs> Remember how they would do those wacky transitions out of out of every segment? That was a toaster. I think so. They were Not using sure. a video toaster. Um, it, w it was a mind-boggling thing at that time. And again, it doesn't seem like so long ago, but nobody could, personal computing wasn't anywhere near powerful enough to do what you were doing. You were doing magic. No, but we could thing. see Moore's Law was going to solve the problem yeah. eventually. I you mean, knew like, it would improve. You had to just extrapolate that line, and at some point, you know, uh, we started to work on um, the, the TriCaster family of products and, and we go well in two or three years Pentium chips are going to be up to 75 <laughs> megahertz oh how could that possibly be no that's what the curve says oh they're gonna and um, you know 
I remember in 92, the first P90 I saw, we was like, this is so fast. You can't believe how fast right. this is. And then, but we knew at some point you could actually process the video happen. through you the computer. You knew it was coming. Yep. But no, I mean, really, seriously, you were doing stuff that nobody was even dreaming of. And it really seemed like a black magic at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was partly because you had Amigas. Which were quite advanced for the, they were multitasking. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, the operating system was perfect. It the task switching in the multitasking of the Amiga was triggered by the top of a video frame, which was absolutely perfect for what we needed to do. It, it was just couldn't what ask was, for better. What was uh, Hollywood and the television community's response to the toaster? Did they laugh at it, say, "Oh, that's you know, that's a amateur product. Yep. We're professionals," or did they Generally, adopt? Did they like it? Well. Uh, because uh, they're there, spending there, millions of dollars. There was a famous, uh, there was a post house called the Post Group, mm -hmm. and uh, they were sort of the pinnacle of post production in right. Hollywood. Right. And I think they're still around in some form. Um, I was talking to a guy from the Post Group at an NAB show, and uh, he came up and um, introduced himself, and he said he was from the Post Group. And I said, So, um, you think you'll ever get a video toaster? And he says, Oh, I've got three of them. I said, That it's surprising to me um, that you would have three of them. I thought there would be a little garage across the street called the Toast Group <laughs> with the toasters. And we he don't said, know those guys. He said, you got to understand, if the customer comes in and asks for something, we I have, have to have it. it. I don't show it to them right. unless I'm prompted. <laughs> I don't and let I them wish, know I can. I wish to heck you had never made the thing, <laughs> but I have them. And that was kind of the attitude. You know, they, they would use it to... Um, for cost, very cost critical uh, jobs where they couldn't, uh, you know, get into the big rooms and have a lot of people. I, I think it was, was it Babylon 5? Babylon 5 was one of the big ones, yeah. Because this was a very polished, slick sci fi show that was very cheap. And they were able to do computer graphics for television in ways that people didn't just, it would have been, you know, Impossible. Absolutely. Before. Were they using Lightwave? What were they? They were, were using they Lightwave on on Amigas. Yeah, and that uh, was also your software mm -hmm. product. Yeah. Yep. Lightwave was part of the toaster. It came right. with it. It was fr just free. Right. And you know there were several basic uh, pieces of the toaster, and one of the little buttons there said 3D, and if you pushed it, it opened <laughs> up this, uh, you know, uh -huh. uh, top, uh -huh. front, and side view, and you could make your objects. And and most people were just scared to death because it reminded them of homework. You know. But uh, you still do Lightwave, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And it still um, comes with the, the TriCaster, doesn't it? Does not. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. No, but uh, a lot of people use it, and um, it's, of course it's, you can integrate it in. Yes. I remember. There yeah, was you can a make button. virtual you, sets. You still uh, have that 3D button that would. Yeah. yeah. But uh, Ron Thornton, who is uh, this uh, genius uh, 3D guy, he uh, he did the effects for Doctor Who. Oh wow. Uh, you know, made aliens out of vacuum cleaners and stuff, <laughs> and, and he he uh, he pitched us on. Um, supporting them in their effort to make Babylon 5. So I had to go meet with the producer of the show, a guy named uh, Doug Netter. And he's a cigar-chomping, classic Hollywood executive. And he, Ronnie tells me here you guys can help us make this show cheap. <laughs> yeah. And we just want to know you're going to support us. Absolutely, we'll support you. <laughs> and that's that's the worst thing I had ever said. Because, um, <laughs> was it really horrible? It was horrible. <laughs> but it made Lightwave much much better because um, for example Ron sent us a frame on a on a floppy drive we put the floppy drive in the computer and there's this gorgeous spaceship on the screen and we just can't believe what we're look, looking at he had made this it was the Babylon 5 ship right in lightwave well a few weeks later he called up and he said guys I'm dead the ship looks great until it starts moving when it starts moving, all the little lights in the portholes start <laughs> to scintillate. <laughs> and uh, we go, oh, yeah, what you're getting there is uh, aliasing. And he says, I, don't, I can't have aliasing. No aliasing. So we had to fix the aliasing. Oh, my and God. Th that's non-trivial. It was. <laughs> but that's what it took. And so customers like that, and Todd Rundgren was another one. Who, I remember who, Todd Rundgren was He sad. would just send us these long faxes would come out of the fax machine. I, I got to have this. I got to have that. This isn't working right. Both a challenge, but at the same time, and I think the the reputation you gained from Babylon Five. I mean, everybody knew they're they're doing this so inexpensively. Yeah, um, it changed the economies of uh, CGI. It, it absolutely and did. Yeah. It absolutely did. Mm -hmm. um, can you see? It? Here's a little bit of a Babylon. All of this done in light wave. No scintillation. No no aliasing. No, on the, the aliasing end. was gone at this point. <laughs> 
And what a great show because it, you know, the plot stretched across the entire series. Yeah. It was uh, unprecedented. Yeah, and they, they, what they were able to do, and it's the first time this was, you know, done in a commercial, inexpensive television series, was really quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. Quite remarkable. So th were they using toasters as well? Uh, what were they doing? Uh, generally speaking, they were just using LightWave. Just designing but, the stuff uh, in LightWave. you know, they, they would... Uh, there would be a toaster in the machine that would let them visualize Got the NTSC it. output. So they could see early renders, yeah. and then they render it out. And, right. Yeah. And then later on, we separated LightWave from the toaster, right. and then they, they didn't need to use it that. without yeah. that. So when, did, what, when was the transition to TriCaster, and, and how did that happen? Well, you know, Commodore uh, encountered some difficulties. <laughs> you know, we were number one with a bullet. With, Named Jack Tremiel, yes. We were, we were selling... <laughs> video toasters like there was no tomorrow yeah. and then suddenly there was no tomorrow they, they went bankrupt <laughs> right and it's the, just the worst possible thing that can happen to a company we had because you really were tied to that platform. yeah we had written code that was you know diddling bits right down into their little custom Eesh. chips it was not portable however uh light wave was written in c and at that time very fortunately for us microsoft came out with win 32 which let us compile for the first time 32-bit uh, C code on a PC. You needed 32 bits because you had massive data sets. And yeah, the whole thing needed, a lot needed of 32 bits. Yeah. yeah. And so we could then uh, start selling LightWave. And for a while, we became so the LightWave So you just ported company. it to Windows, mm -hmm. that's all? Yep, and we also ported it to uh, the Mac, and we ported it to Linux, and we ported it to the Deck Alpha. We had a lot of versions Isn't C there. great? <laughs> yeah, <that's> great. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of amazing that you could, you could actually do that. And then we sort of reset, and we said, we want to make a, a, a new toaster-like product, but, you know... On modern hardware. On modern hardware, yeah. And it, with the lesson learned from the Amiga, you probably didn't want to tie it too tightly to the to the hardware base. No, not a particular brand, certainly. But we, 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 we realized that the IBM PC that was going to be the best yeah. uh, platform because Apple was still kind of a closed system. Right. And we really would have liked to use the it Apple. It had that because, nice 68,000 yeah, in there. It was much more similar to the Amiga, but yeah. um, no, we couldn't do it. You, why not? You, 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 you needed something that was more open. What, how, what was the difference between what Apple was doing at that time and Microsoft? Well, um, you didn't want to be on one hardware platform? It looked to us like um, Apple was going to move slower in, right. in increasing the speed. Right. Yep. And it, there was just this insane development, uh, uh, high-speed development going on in the PC. They changed every month. They got right. better. And the graphics cards. Right. Um, and it's analogous it's, to what's going on now with mobile, where yes. Android is churning, 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 and Apple's just kind of steadily... Yep. And, and, and we also, were, you probably didn't want to be tied to one company as you were with Commodore. Yes. For that... Once burned, twice shy. Yeah. Yeah. And Apple was also, you know, looking kind of At those days, shaky. this is mid-90s, not, not the best place right. to be. So we were able to, you know, Moore's Law is still going on, and we're also taking advantage of the huge changes in gaming mm -hmm. and the uh, GPUs. Did you use DirectX, OpenGL, any of that stuff? All of the above. All yeah. of the above. Mm -hmm. At different times, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, today, I mean, uh, the graphics cards are just, you know, it's, it's staggering the amount of processing that's going on in those things. So in the early days, did you bypass the GPUs and just was all CPU-based? In CPU the early based? days, it was mostly CPU. And you'd maybe make some... I, there was additional hardware, right? You had to put some cards in there? Yeah, the card was to do the I.O. Because it's not so, fast enough to take all that un data. Unlike the old video toaster that had a lot of video chips on it and a lot mm -hmm. of processing, all we had to do was get the video signal into computer memory and then back out of computer memory after we were done processing. Using DMA, just so yep. you're, bla you're and, blasting it in. And there. that's all that card did. And, yeah. and uh, basically today's cards do the same thing, Right. in essence. Right. We do everything in software. How interesting. And yet the capabilities now are amazing. Yeah, I mean, I'm shocked. It is, it's great living in the future. <laughs> we're going to see something. I guess we have some new, something new to announce in a little bit. Uh, let me take a break. I want to come back and talk to you about f movies okay. and about your movie, about Vermeer. All right. Because I think that's kind of... Was this all along the same time you're doing the engineering and been, the software? Yeah, I've been working on it for you never four lost or that, five years. never lost that dream to do a movie. No. That's I was neat. a frustrated filmmaker, and now I'm is, a fulfilled film, filmmaker. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. We're talking... Uh, this, is, this is a lot of fun. I hope you're enjoying it. 
We're talking to a, li a literally a living legend, the guy who really made it possible to do what we do, Tim Jennison, the founder of uh, New Tech, founder of the Video Toaster, uh, creator of the Video Toaster, and uh, also a filmmaker. And there's been a lot of talk about Oscar just in the last couple of days. We're getting the exclusive on this one. Our show today brought to you by Shutterstock.com. 28 million high-quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, video clips. You know, you can get... Babylon 5, forget it. You can get you can get beautiful illustrations, graphics, vectors for your blog, for your publication, for your menu, for your website, for your Facebook landing page at Shutterstock.com. Start by just creating a free account. You don't even need to give them a credit card number. Just so you can play with it. The search engine is so cool. You can search not only with nouns, you know, TVs, but you can search with adjectives. Happy TVs, blue TVs. Uh, Christmas TVs. Uh, many contributors to Shutterstock are professionals, artists, photographers. They do great videos. Shutterstock has 28 million images right now, and they are adding more than 10,000 images every day. So there's always something new. They uh, sell image packs and monthly subscriptions. But uh, like I said, start with a free account, because what you can start doing is saving these images to light boxes. Those are just collections that you can review later, you can use for inspiration, share with colleagues, Say, I think this is what it should look like. What about this? I frankly, I think having a great image is a great way to get inspired for that blog post. You could do that all. Shutterstock recently partnered with Facebook. You've probably seen the Shutterstock images on its uh, ad tool, its ad creation tool. These are free to advertising customers. It's a great resource for local businesses that want really slick professional ads. You can use these tools too. Try the uh, Shutterstock iPad app. It's Webby Award winning. Gorgeous. And then if you decide to buy, all I ask is you use our offer code triangulation and the number nine. All one word. Nine because we're in the month of September, the ninth month. And you will get 30% off whatever you buy, which is a great deal. Almost a third off if you use the offer code triangulation nine shutterstock.com. Truly a great place to get your imagery. So tell me about this. It's called Tim's Vermeer. Yeah, I, before we get to that, I, you seem to have a love for machines, for beautiful machinery, pinball games, computers. You have a clover coffee maker? Yes, <laughs> I do. One of the few private individuals, maybe the only <laughs> private individual. Clover is that thing that, the, the, guy, that uh, the guy at Starbucks, Howard, saw and said, I'm not letting that stay in business. I'm going to put Starbucks out of business. He bought the company and said, and no one else can get another one. Did you get your Clover before that? Or did you uh, talk no, Howard afterwards. into afterwards. Uh, we got it from a, a dealer who said, uh, hey, this... I have one this, in stock. I, yeah, exactly. I'm not going to be able to sell these. Wow. We, we can't get spare parts for it, so we have to hack on it to keep it working. You need a 3D printer. Titanium 3D one. printer. Yeah, print parts for your Clover. So I get the sense that you like... There's a, that You see a beauty in perfect machinery and, and things that work beautifully. Uh, you talk about high quality audio. That's the same thing, right? Are you one of those audio files with vacuum tubes and, you know, Macintosh amps and sand tables yes. for your turntable? Yes, I, I have Martin Logan electrostatic speakers with Acoustat vacuum oh, tube amps. Oh, man. The, it's nice, nice sound. And what do you use for the source? Uh, the, you know, just a good CD vinyl? player. CD. Yeah, you know, vinyl is overrated. I mean, there's some good things about it, but when you talk about pinch distortion, when that needle gets toward the center of the record, yeah, it's not good. I, I don't, I've never understood this. Now, I'm excited about what Neil Young's doing with Pono to do these 96-bit, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, higher quality digitization. Yeah, that's neat. I think that there's some hope there. You know, yeah. if you're recording it that way, let's let's hear it that way. Mm -hmm. But I agree. It's the, marginally better. I mean, uh, CD audio, 16-bit, 44 kilohertz, it's not bad. It's hard. It, 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 in the early days of mastering CDs, they made a lot of mistakes, and it got a bad reputation. It took them a while to learn uh, how to avoid that. It's not bad. I remember some very bad CDs in the early mm -hmm. days. You could hear the hiss from the record, <laughs> the record player. Yeah, or you could hear in cymbals, uh, especially uh, sort of soft passages with cymbals, you heard crunchiness. Yeah. That was typical. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I guess a Vermeer is also in some ways a perfect machine. At least it's a perfect creation. Yeah, you know, uh, he, 
Vermeer painted about 350 years ago in Holland, part of the, uh, the Dutch golden age of painting, uh, where the painters were trying to emulate reality. They wanted it to mm -hmm. be like you were looking through a window. He painted the girl with the pearl earring. Yeah, his seen most famous one. that painting. So just yeah. so people can get an image yeah. in their head of what, yeah. what we're talking about. And, uh, you know, uh, about 1839, when photography was invented, long after the Vermeer was dead and gone, uh, people started to say, hey, you know, these photographs kind of look like Vermeer's. That's weird. Um, and there is something photographic. You know, when you look at uh, adver advertising art today, you can usually tell if somebody has started with a photograph to make yeah. their artwork. There's got a yeah. look to it. Or a little kid comes in with a, a picture of a cartoon character, a superhero. He says, look what I drew. And it's obviously traced, traced right? right. And you go, did you lay it over the top of the comic book? <laughs> oh, yes, I did. How, yeah, hey, how did you know? Out. Yeah. He invented it. And, and so there's that look that we can kind of pick up. Well, I was looking at um, uh, one of Vermeer's pictures called The Music Lesson. And, Beautiful painting. And it, uh, it spoke to me. It said, I am a photograph. And, but there were no cameras back then. So... There's been a lot of speculation about how painters could have gotten the shapes right and the perspective right by tracing a projection. You know, right. You can set up a simple yeah. lens and it projects right. onto a flat surface and of course you can go in and trace that. But I suspected that Vermeer was tracing not only the shapes but the colors. Because they're so accurate. Yes. And it turns out the human eye is incapable of seeing what Vermeer painted. And here's the way that works. There's a white wall in the back of his painting. Mm -hmm. When we look at a white wall, our brain and our retinas tend to interpret it as a solid color, right. even though it's infinite shades. Yeah. And it's happening right in our retina. There's image processing going on it's inside not in the brain. our retina. Not it's in the actually brain. in the eye. Yeah, and it's this local contrast enhancement that's going on that helps us see into shadows. So evolutionarily, it helped us uh, avoid prey, uh, avoid predators, and, right. and, and see prey. Right. Uh, we, uh, our, it's a motion our, detector. Uh, it's a motion detector also, but it's, it's also just trying to eliminate the effect of shadows. Right. Well, these, these walls that Vermeer painted had accurate shadows. And, and they, they shouldn't. They shouldn't. You can't see them. His contemporaries would make a lame attempt at putting a shadow on, but Vermeer nailed it just the way a video camera sees it. And that's what got me going. And I go, there must have been a there must have been a machine he could have used to do that. It's the only explanation. Now, and where is this painting? It's hanging in Buckingham Palace. The Queen of England owns it, and <laughs> you, you can only get in to see it. Uh, have you few, seen it? Yes, yeah, a few weeks a year you can get in and see it. Um, and when I started looking at these Vermeers in person, you know, not in reproduction, because you, it, I, we're showing an image on a, a three hundred pixel image from the. Internet, it doesn't do it justice. No, it's it's gone through a process at that point. And, yeah, uh, that image you're looking at right it's there, JPEG like hell, was probably know. taken from like a medium format right. uh, film image. Right. And by that time, it's gone. But you, if you look at that back wall, you, you can, can see, see something going on yeah, there. The, the double shadow behind that mirror and behind mm -hmm. that harpsichord. And if you look, at the, the brightest part of the wall is right up next to the uh, window there. The darkest part of the wall is down behind the gentleman, clear to the right. Right. And the ratio of light there, it's almost pure black and almost pure white. But it reads to us, if we were in that room, it would read to us as all beige. Right. And that's what you would paint. And if you can't paint it, you can't see it. So, Could, Is it possible Vermeer trained his eye somehow to... You can't. You can't? You can't. You physically can't. The, the retina is built the way the retina is built, and it can't see that. So this is a little bit of a, a mystery. It is a big mystery. And um, So when did you first observe this? Uh, I was. Uh, I go to this trade show every year in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. the IBC show. It's a big broadcasting show, and the, and uh, I was at the museum, uh, the Rijksmuseum, where they have some Vermeers, and I was looking at the Vermeers, and uh, later, after looking at them, I go, "This, I think I see how he did it." No, 
I think I see how he did it. <laughs> and so I went home. Knowing what you do about optics, about light, I mean, well, uh, it, it, have it's you studied this science? more what I know about electronics. Really? There is a, a, an electronic circuit called a comparator. It's a very simple circuit. You have two signals coming in into this little black box. Mm -hmm. And the comparator will tell you which one is higher than the other, right? Very simple device. And I reasoned that Vermeer had a, a, a very a simple analog form of comparator. comparator. It had to be analog. We're talking the 16th, 17th century. Yep. Yeah. So I went home and I did this experiment on my kitchen table <laughs> where I, I propped up a photograph and I put um, a panel down on, flat on the table to paint on and I set up this mirror at a 45 degree angle, tiny mirror on a stick. So I'm looking down in the mirror and in the reflection in the mirror, I see the photograph. If I look off the edge of the mirror, I see my panel down on, on the table. I took some paint and I put it on the panel. And now, right at the edge of the mirror, I can compare those two colors very uh, accurately. Uh, oh, wait, that is way too bright. Mix in some black. Wow. Okay. Once you've got it mixed and it's the proper color, the edge of the mirror goes away. So if it's too bright, you can see the edge of the mirror. If it's too dark, you can see the edge of the mirror. If it's exactly right, you can't see the edge of the mirror. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. It is not subjective at all. It's objective. You are a photo sensor. It's mechanical. You, Here's an image of uh, Tim uh, doing this from a photograph. This is from the movie Tim's Vermeer. Yeah, this, is, uh, this is that first test I did. Uh, my daughter walked by with her digital camera and took a picture of it. So that picture vertically there. So um, the mirror is attached to your glasses. No, no, no. Oh, I'm, you're looking through it. The mirror is glued to a mic stand. I see. And I'm looking down into it. And, um, and you see there uh, that on the table that I've made an exact copy of that photograph. This is the very first oil painting I've ever done. <laughs> you're not an artist. I'm you're not, not a, a painter. I'm not an artist. I've never painted in my life. Um, and That's it, quite and amazing. It, and it works so well, I go, okay. I'm on to something here. So I started Googling. I figure somebody in the world has figured this out. So I Googled for a day. I Googled for a week. I Googled for weeks. I, I, I Googled in other languages, German, Dutch, Italian, Latin, you know, looking for speculum. I'm looking for Spiegel. I'm looking for Kunst. I'm looking for all these words that relate to artists and mirrors. And I found a lot of stuff, but not that. You'd think if this technique uh, were widely used in Renaissance painting that it, it would be known. How was that he keeping is, a secret? That is the, one of the best arguments against this theory. But they had they had guilds, right? Like the free the Freemasons would not teach laymen how to lay right. out the first course of bricks. We've you know? lost a lot of techniques. Yeah, because, because of, of this. Because of the secrecy. Yeah, so they would have been keeping it all secret. That That, that is the explanation. Were there others of Vermeer's contemporaries who might have used this technique yes. if you look at their paintings? Now that I've been doing the research on it, I think I see this idea traveling through time and oh, across Europe. So how, how did you tell the world about this? Well, um, after I did that experiment on my kitchen table... Which um, is pretty impressive. That's a good picture. Yeah. Uh, I surprised myself, and I, you know, I said, this works way too well. Yeah. And it's simple. You know, it's right. elegant. It's mechanical. There's you just, can't go wrong. There's just nothing to it. Um, so, I got a strange email from my friend Penn Gillette of Penn & Teller, uh, who I've known for Penn close to 30 years. Penn was also a video toaster fanatic. Yeah? Yeah. And Penn... Is that um, how you got to know him? Yeah, yeah, way, way back when. And um, Penn wrote me this letter, strange, um, desperate-sounding letter, email. He said, I have been spending all my time with my toddlers and at work, and I am in need of an adult conversation. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> Would you please come over and talk to me? Oh, that's great. And, you know, it's the weirdest email I ever got from him. So I, I said, sure, I'll, I'll come over. And um, we sat down at uh, one of these Brazilian steak places where they pile yeah. the meat on. And, and <laughs> Penn, said, yeah. Penn said, I do not want to hear anything about show business. I do not want to talk about politics. I do not want to talk about anything that could involve work, okay? 
What do you what got? What do you got? <laughs> and I said, well, have you heard of Vermeer? I, I, I said, uh, what do you know about Vermeer? He said, the painter? I said, yeah. He said, well, I, I went to his big uh, show back in New York uh, many years ago, and, you know, he paints you know, photographic photorealism. I said, yeah, I think I figured out how he did it. And he said, what? And, and I explained it to him, and then I realized I had it on my belt. I had um, a, um, a camcorder, and I had a video clip there where I had looked down through the mirror. Oh, neat. So you could actually show see him. it. And he says, I get this. I, I totally get how this works. It's sure, just, he's a magician. He's, he's a mechanical it's very, genius. very similar to a magic trick. It's, it's how they do these disappearing things. It's, it's called yeah. mirror masking in yeah. magic. Yeah. yeah. And so he said, I, I, he got I totally get this. He got it immediately. He understands yeah. the optics. And he said, what are you going to do with this? And I said, I, I'm going to try to paint uh, something that looks like a Vermeer. And, and I'm going to try to put this, you know, make a YouTube video about it. And he said, that is a really stupid stupid idea. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, you, let's make a movie, a real movie about this. Let's go to L.A. tomorrow and start pitching this. And that's how it started. And it just uh, snowballed and took on a life of its own. That, was ha that happened in February of 2009. And we didn't think it would take too long. But uh, we just finished the movie just uh, two weeks ago. You and actually said, I'm going to paint the music lesson. Yeah. So what I had to do is I had to, uh, in Lightwave 3D, I made an exact 3D model of that room and all the furniture and all the architectural features of the room, reconstructed the room. You didn't start from Vermeer's painting. No. Holy I, I made cow. the 3D you, model. You from. made what he was painting from. So that once I had the 3D models, then I used rapid prototyping <laughs> and Computer, uh, CNC, computer-controlled milling machines, and lathes to make all that furniture. Uh, I built a full-size replica of his studio uh, with the harpsichord, the viola da gamba, the wow. Turkish rug, um, everything. Everything was in there. And then I set up the machine the way I thought he must have used it. Not looking at his painting anymore. I'm I'm now looking through the apparatus and trying to paint. And there were some false starts. There were, there, it uh, didn't work exactly right the first time. And it took me about seven months to paint it. And when I was finished, it, w it, it was... Did it, was, it look it was, like it? It was the same. It was the same Variety picture. wrote uh, yesterday, Peter DeBrugge, their senior film critic, so entertaining that audiences hardly even realize how incendiary it is. Tim's Vermeer stirs up a flurry of scandal in the hallowed realm of art history. Obsessive inventor Tim Jennison has a hunch that the only explanation for the photorealistic quality evident in the work of 17th century Dutch painter Johannes Vermeer is that he cheated using lenses or some other technological apparatus to achieve such remarkable detail. Jennison advises a five-year science experiment to test his theory emerging with an uncanny crowd pleaser, the secret weapon in Sony Pictures Classics Fall Arsenal that plays like the ultimate episode of Mythbusters. People are actually talking Academy Award for Best Documentary. How exciting. Very so exciting. Teller is involved too, right? Teller directed, uh, Penn produced. And Penn uh, narrates. Penn narrates, yeah, and he appears on film. Yeah. Um, I can't wait to see this. So... Uh, you show they showed it at Telluride. They're, I think they're still showing it. What did they? Uh, it's going to be at Toronto. It'll be at the New York Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And uh, did, did they have? A, is Sony's distributing it. Is, yep. it, is there a theatrical date? Yeah, uh, before the end of the year, they want to get it out before the end of the year in New York and L.A. I guess be, uh, because of the uh, Academy rules, they need to have right. It. Yep. Because you want to be eligible. Because uh, everybody's talking Oscar for this. David Hockney, the famous painter who did. A lot of photos in his in his artwork is is in it. What does the art world, what does the real art world have to say about this? We don't know. They're going to um, flip their lids. You know, it's been totally under wraps until four days ago. It's been total secret. Nobody knew about this film. So we suspect that uh, some of them will maybe change their minds, but others are so set in their ways. Um, that, Hockney that, kind of intimated that this was possibly Hockney what was going on. Hockney wrote a book called Secret Knowledge yeah. uh, 12 years ago. Uh, where he said something changed in art. About 1500s, 1600s, something changed radically. 
and I think it was caused by optics. Now, he didn't know my trick, but he thought they were tracing. You know, he right. thought they were just getting the shapes and the perspective right. right. And uh, he, nobody had really suspected there's a way to trace the colors. But and he knew because he's an artist, he could look at it and he said something, yeah. there's a switch that got flipped. Yeah. And it's interesting because he realized that, but it took you to come along and say, I think mm -hmm. I know how they did it. Mm -hmm. So early Holy in the film, we, uh, before, we, before I started painting or anything, we uh, went to visit Hockney in England, and I ran the idea past him. I showed him the, my first experiment, and I said, uh, do you think this is going to work? And he said, I absolutely think it would work. And, and um, I said, do you think that they were doing this in the golden age? And he says, absolutely, I believe they were doing it in the golden age. You know, more almost than the wall, though I can see why the wall is convincing. I look at the tapestry here, and the detail yeah. in that, and that that looks like a photo. Yeah, uh, yeah. that is remarkable. You're looking at Vermeer's picture there, uh, and um, yes, this isn't. I should say this is not a Jenison. Right. <laughs> this is a Vermeer. Yeah. <laughs> when you were painting that, I mean, what what is your experience of painting it? it, it it's all mechanical for you, right? Yeah, it's it's a Zen thing. You, you're you're a machine. Yeah. Uh, all those little dots on that carpet. Uh, uh, are, are a different color. And the mirror tells you exactly what color it needs to be. And all you have to do is just sort of dab in the different colors <laughs> until you've got the right and one. And there it is. Yep. Uh, how close, you must have been highly zoomed in to do this, right? I mean, yeah. highly magnified. If you're seeing every dot in that. Not really magnified. It's The, the picture is 25 by 29 inches. Mm -hmm. It's laying flat on a table. And I'm about 8 inches above the surface of it. So that's the kind of magnification okay. I'm seeing. And you're not doing any optical magnification. You're actually no. looking directly I'm at I'm looking it. directly at the canvas. And yeah. what kind of uh, brush were you using? It must have been very fine. I used fine. Uh, a lot of different brushes, but they were all sable brushes. Very fine sable yeah. points. Yeah. And they're generally used for watercolor. Right. But um, that's what worked. And this is oils that you were using? Yeah. I had to, had to make the paint. <laughs> Um, because uh, I wanted to use only Authentic paints that he had. Pigments. We know exactly which pigments he was using because of the scientific analysis. Right. Uh, and so you a, were grinding lead? Yeah. And, yeah. Holy cow. And mercury. And, oh, my God. Yeah. Very, very Dangerous nasty stuff. Dangerous stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And how, what was the, how long, five years this, ta this took? How long did this uh, take? When I actually got the room completed, and started painting, it took about seven months. From, from the, so the light wave thing was the first step getting it all mm -hmm. modeled out. Mm -hmm. And how did you get it modeled so precisely? I mean, that's, well, it, that's it, a challenge in, in itself. In Lightwave, you can do this, you can put an image in the background and you can wipe back and forth and you can overlay uh, lines on it. And then you make certain assumptions. You make assumptions that the walls are 90 degrees right. to each other. Right. And, um, and then it'll add volume as, as yeah, needed. And so by using those basic wow. assumptions, you make a three-dimensional model of the room. You were working from a, must have been a very high quality no, reproduction. There no, there were. Uh, the reproductions were all terrible. Uh, the one I'm looking at, which is the best I could find, is on iBiblio. Yeah. And this is actually a special site that they have for art. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's I, you know, you zoom in on it and you see all the JPEG artifacting. Yeah, yeah. If you zoom, uh, pan down now to that harpsichord and the lower flap right there, the lower flap is just a mishmash yeah. of stuff. Yeah. But when I saw the actual Vermeer in Buckingham Palace, it's sharp as a tack. Yeah. Everything is there. So where did you get your copy? Did you go in and take a picture? No. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't have a copy. However, uh, that harpsichord... Though they still exist in museums. It, it was a, it was a uh, Flemish company called Rutgers, and those decorations on there were block-printed paper, and the paper is still on those instruments. And so I had this guy in Edinburgh make me those papers so I could construct that uh, instrument to look exactly like that. We know exactly what Vermeer was seeing because it still exists. Just slightly obsessive. You think? <laughs> you know, they, they have... Um, they what have, do your family think about this? They, ha they have medications <laughs> for this, but they wouldn't give, them, give me any until the film was finished. <laughs> no. I'm sure Penn's going, no, paint right. more. <laughs> uh, my family couldn't have been nicer about it. My, uh, my daughter posed. It's so cute. And, oh, she was the girl? Yeah, and she had to have her head in a clamp for hours and hours and hours to hold her head Holy still. Holy cow. Um, well, everybody's raving about it. The L.A. Times probably the, the biggest uh, rave. In fact... Uh, the L.A. Times basically says that you're going to set the art world on its ear 
uh, with this. Both inspired and insane, he says. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, I, I am dying to see it. I cannot wait till it comes out. And um, I think a lot of people agree from the reviews that I've read that, that as much as what you're doing is interesting, if it weren't for it's Tim Tim Jennison and how much they loved you and and we were taken by your obsession. That's really what makes the movie. Yeah, the movie ended up being about it's my about you about my mental illness more, <laughs> more than Vermeer. Yeah. Although I just wonder what the art world's uh, going to say because in effect you're yeah. saying that Vermeer is not an artist, that he's a copyist. Well, I, I don't agree with that. I, I think he was uh, a, a very talented nerd. I, you know, I, I, <laughs> he I, did compose the image, right? He, he put the Indeed. image together, and he was trying to make a perfect image. He was Probably trying to make a beautiful image. As much an artist as a photographer today is an artist. And and you know, a better analogy might be what we do in motion pictures today. Right. We try to every we use everything we got to make a great looking image on that screen whether it's uh, computer generated or whatever we use we're not we'll use any technology any skill we can right, right. to make a picture and that's what they were doing back then you know it's it's uh it's the same thing well i tim i'm thrilled that we could uh, talk to you i think we got an exclusive uh on the success of uh tim's vermeer i can't wait to see the movie and i again thank you for what has been a long journey for you a 30-year uh, journey in, to to make the tricaster uh, how much are you involved in today's TriCaster? Uh, as little as possible. <laughs> I, I, no, I mean, You're busy painting. Uh, you got I, a whole career as a painter ahead of you. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in the early days, I, I did a lot of the code and a lot of the yeah, uh, yeah. design. And, um, and today, we have the best team on the planet. You and, do. And, uh, I, will, I will tell you that. And uh, a Andrew Cross, especially, who is a, a super genius. And It's nice to have somebody to run the business, and you yeah. can just enjoy... Yeah. what you're making. The weird thing about Andrew Cross, he's an engineer who will tell you how long something's going to take and it will be right. That's unheard of. It is unheard that of. That doesn't exist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, we're going to we're going to get into just a bit go over Don's going to show us I don't know, something new, something different, something exciting. Do I don't know. I have I wouldn't sign an NDA, so I have not been informed. <laughs> it's top secret. It's top secret. Are, is this the first time it's been shown anywhere? Yes. All right, we're going to we're going to see something brand new. Uh, Tim, thank you so much for making uh, our day here. I'm thrilled to have met you. Thanks for inviting me. This has been fun. A real honor. And uh, again, thank you for making what we do possible because I don't think there's any other hardware that could do what we do day in, day out. I know the TriCaster wasn't designed for 24-7 operation, but we're running a live TV station on a TriCaster. It's, it's absolutely amazing what you're doing here. It's so and exciting. I'm, it's inspiring. Thank you. Well, I'm much more inspired by what you're doing, so thank you. Uh, Tim Jennison, everybody, uh, New Tech, NewTech.com. We're going to see their stuff in just a bit. I want to thank you for joining us for this edition of Triangulation. We do this show Wednesday afternoons, 3.30 Pacific, 6.30 Eastern Time, 22.30 UTC. If you want to tune in and watch live, I really appreciate the chat room. They give me lots of good leads, lots of great questions. That's why we call it Triangulation. It's me, the guest, and you. So please be here for our live show. But if you can't watch live, audio and video on demand always after the fact available at uh, twit.tv slash TRI. We also put it on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash triangulation. And of course, uh, you can always subscribe. That's the best thing. That way you won't miss an episode. iTunes, Dogcatcher, Instacast, Pocketcast, whatever you use, make sure you subscribe, subscribe uh, to Triangulation. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next Wednesday on Triangulation.